We are live. Welcome to Luke Cage season that series review. Great start. So I'm gonna start by telling you this was a show I really loved. There will be some jokes in this video, and I'll probably get into a lot of serious topics. So the yes. I realize this video is long, I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time. And that brings, yes, so this video is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger while I'm spoiling so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the MCU. I, I will, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to talk that much about the like core MCU continuity, but it is, there are some things about this show that I can only really comment on if I spoil Jessica Jones season one, for example, since season one of this show takes place, you know, takes place and premiered after season one of that show. Now, the, let's see. So I have watched every episode of both seasons once each, and that brings us to the plot. So, following the events of Jessica Jones Season 1, Luke goes back home to Harlem and finds himself reluctantly getting into a conflict with the biggest criminals of the area. And, yeah, so the... This is definitely a case where you'll want to watch, at the very least, the a couple of things in in order. You'll want to watch Jessica Jones season one before season one of this, and The Defenders, which only had the one season before season two of this. You don't need to watch the other shows, but... For sure, the... Yeah. And... Yes, you know, like other Netflix shows, you know, I can only speak from personal experience with the Marvel Netflix shows since they're no longer on Netflix, they're on Disney+, Plus, which is why I watch them at all. I do not have Netflix. I don't intend to get Netflix. Yes, I know some of their originals are apparently amazing. Like other Netflix shows, this is very much bingeable, and the, the, yeah, basically, many episodes will end in a way that really makes you want to watch the next episode as well, and you can basically, like, I watched an episode per day, occasionally more than one per day. If you want to sit down and watch, like, an entire season, you know, it's 13 episodes, a couple of them reach an hour, but otherwise the, you know, the, the running time varies a lot, which is good. I wish they would have more, I wish they tailored how many episodes are in a season to how much story they felt they had to tell, but at least they do vary the, the specific episode running running times now the that brings us to the writing so this had an entire writing room worth of people and let's see yeah so Series creator Cheo Hodari Coker is, yeah, is credited with, you know, all 26 episodes as creator, writer of five episodes, and otherwise the various, yeah, the episodes are divided between the, the various staff writers. The writing really gets a lot right. This is a show where the characters are very complex, especially, you know, not all of them, but there's a lot of complexity, and 
just the the identity is is very very strong for for the the show for Harlem for the individual characters this is very much a show that isn't interested in just the usual stereotypes about black people the pilot is really really strong the the it does a really good job of setting up the the kind of the core cast at least for the i'm, I'm not going to give away how long they remain core cast the the conflicts between them the relationships between them and yeah you know the, the um if you if you're not already sold on watching the show i think watching the the pilot maybe give it the first three episodes i would say but definitely the pilot gives you a really strong sense of what it is the finale i, I actually yeah before i Right, so yeah, the pilot is quite strong, and so is the season two opener. This was a show that ran for two seasons. The season two opener does a really good job of telling us what things are like now, since, you know, as I already mentioned, in between the two seasons, The Defender has happened, and just, yeah, the, the you know, things are different in season two, as is quite a good idea if you, if you can make that work for for a tv show you know it's it's really good if the different seasons are distinct from each other the season two the, ah, the season one finale is pretty good but it definitely does have some issues and the the yeah the season two finale is very very strong it's Yeah, it's, it's not a spoiler to say it is the kind of thing that you can really see how they could have made a third season. And the fact that right now it's not really in the cards. Like, it's possible that it will happen down the line. But so far, Daredevil is the only one to have been confirmed to be joining the MCU of, of the Marvel Netflix shows. And I, I do get that. There's definitely, you know... He has a very broad appeal that maybe some of these others lack, which, you know, I personally find frustrating. I, I definitely, you know, to me, Jessica Jones is the most interesting of, of these, but, yeah. The, the, um, yeah, the season two finale, really the only bad thing I can say about it is it really makes you wish there was a season three, but... Yeah, other than that, it really is, it's it's a very strong season finale, and not as, yeah, it was not meant to be the series finale, very clearly. I, oh, right, I, do, I haven't mentioned yet, but uh, for spoilers, I will not be getting into spoilers in this video, other than, you know, I already mentioned, I might, you know, but then I'll verbally warn before I do so. If you want to hear my spoiler thoughts on the the yeah the the show, I did one video on season one and another video on season two, and they there will be a link to the description box that has them in. There will be a link to the playlist that has them in the description box. Now. It is definitely, this This has an issue of waxing and waning stories, you know, I, it's not very reasonable to expect them to be able to tell a story over 13 episodes that never waxes or wanes, although, you know, I do think a strong case could be made that the first season of Daredevil manages that, but... It is very, very difficult to, to make that happen, and that's definitely something, you know, and, and also some of the changes to the status quo, 
you know, I'm, I'm not sure I've encountered anyone who straight up gave up on the show, but I have encountered a number of user reviews that said that they didn't think it was worth sticking through the show once certain status quo changes were, were made. And I do really, really understand that. That brings us to direction. So, the... Yeah, so there are very few white people on the show. Most are black, some Latinx, reflecting Harlem. I love that this is a show where the black adults know and appreciate black history. The good try to use that for good, while those who choose evil use it for selfish purposes. And a number of the young people don't know these things, and they sometimes make bad choices because of it. The... the it has... You know, by, by now, it is not, it's not a controversial statement to point out that in order to improve things, you have to know the history of, for example, the labor movement, or in this case, you know, class warfare and civil rights movement. And, yeah, you know, the... the And, and, yeah, uh, okay, I'll just briefly say, you know, the, the, actually, I will, I will link a video in the description box that says it, uh, so let's see, uh, there we go, yes. Now, a very strong theme is who's willing to step up and take the risk, which is important for black people in America. There will always be a risk, or it, it will be a long time before it is risk-free for a black person in America to go and try to change things, like, on a systemic level, you know, and actually... You know, put your face out there and make it clear that you're going to fight for certain things. Now, since Luke is bulletproof, the show has to come up with other things for us to worry happen, and it does a really great job at it. Now, if you have a show where the first season is very focused, it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes and toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have a lot of power lose that power, or vice versa. Major character loses something that used to define them, has to come up with a new identity. So a short list of shows that do this, and to be clear, not all of them in season two. Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice... Daredevil, Jessica Jones, and this. Now, so according to Wikipedia, so yeah, Coker was hired as showrunner in March 2015, focused on the themes of race and black culture with a neo black exploitation, new neo western tone. Filming for the series, which looked to replicate the unique culture and atmosphere of Harlem, took place in New York City. And it really, like, yeah, you, you really get a very strong sense of, of Harlem. Now, right, so some critic quotes. So one critic said of season two, nearly every episode this season is loaded with style and directorial flourishes. Most Marvel Netflix shows can be flat visually, but Luke Cage makes great use of shadows and filters. Scenes are bathed in neon reds, sickly oranges, emerald greens. Characters creep out of the shadows. On top of this, the fights, of which there are many, are pulse-pounding and exciting. We can practically feel each punch, each kick, each wall-shattering body slam. Best of all, we can see it. Superhero films have descended into blurry, incoherent fight sequences created in computers. The fights in Luke Cage look and feel genuine. They're scrappy and brutal and on full display. And... Yeah, Luke Cage is more slow burn character drama. Action junkies need not worry, there's plenty of throwdowns and explosions, but the show is more concerned with the quieter moments. 
the most street-level superhero series yet, Luke Cage's creator Shio Hodari Coker has described it as a hip-hop western, which really is a perfect way to summarize it. Luke himself is a terrific lead character. Like a classic western hero, he's a stranger wandering into town, reluctantly taking it upon himself to clear it up. However, he's an urban cowboy, as Harlem is the second main character of the show, with lots of hip-hop music per episode demonstrating its culture. Much ink will be spilled on the show's music, and rightly so, but visually Luke Cage views like an actual comic. The use of still camera panning and framing techniques brings the world to life in a way its predecessors never managed. While ja Daredevil, Daredevil and Jessica Jones were able to recreate iconic panels, Luke Cage flows from one panel to the next, creating a feel singular to reading an actual issue, and the camera work keenly informs the narrative throughout. Cornell Stokes played Avon Barksdale style by Mahershala Ali is often censored in still camera shots framed by windows or his giant Biggie Smalls painting to illustrate the mob boss's myopia. Contrast this with his cousin Mariah Dillard, Alfred Woodard, playing the political game featured in upshots and wide angle shots to illustrate her reach and vision for Harlem. It's that attention to detail that really helps keep the narrative rolling, even though pacing issues uh, even through pacing issues that have been known to haunt Marvel's Netflix slate. Undeniably Harlem, there's barely a white face on the street with much dedicated to the soul of this area. While this is a black show, the only element it bars from the black exploitation that the comic book version was born out of is the music, arguably the part that deserves to continue. Fans of the genre or its parodies will see the best of it in Luke Cage, but soundtrack aside, it still feels like a modern show. This portrayal is very important in the current political climate, making the show timely. Let's see. Yeah, so um, one user reviewer said that someone had written that if you didn't like this show, it's because you're racist. Uh, some say it has a low score because it's from the USA. People there are racist. If you don't like black people, you won't watch a show about a black hero in a black neighborhood with a cast of nearly only black people. I want to briefly argue against this. The way I see it, basically, a lot of racists get off on the hatred. They love spreading this hatred. That's why. But... It is important to note that not every single person who dislikes the show is racist. Some of them do provide actual arguments, like talking about the pacing. Let's see... I did, you know, I do personally think it's pretty pointless to make a review that doesn't go into the politics, since that is infinitely more important for the show than stuff like pacing. And, you know, certainly, if you take issue with the show's politics, please explain why so we can have a debate about it. But yeah, to be clear, negative reviews of the show are not necessarily racist. And I realize I've, I meant to bring this up sooner in this video. I'm not trying to white-splain this show. I am trying to... I'm trying to understand why the show has really struck a chord with the African-American community and... Yeah, help spread that, you know, yeah, help help people be aware of the things about the show that really work for black people. And sadly, I have encountered people who won't listen to the ideas of black people if it's only black people talking about them. So here I am. Now, that brings us to the character. So, Mike Coulter stars as Luke Cage. And, yeah, so, you know, as we found out in Jessica Jones Season 1, he, you know, he is a former convict. His original name was Carl Lucas. And, yeah, he, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, has superhuman strength, unbreakable skin, and fights crime under the name Luke Cage. And, 
According to Wikipedia, Coulter portrayed the character differently in the series than he had previously in Marvel's Jessica Jones, explaining you're not always the same person around everyone you know. You might not necessarily behave the same way around your mom that you would with your wife or your boss. And... Let's see... Right, the character uses his signature catchphrase, Sweet Christmas, from the comics in the series, but sparingly, with the character often opting for pensive silence. Composer Adrian Young said he's a black superhero, but he's a different type of black alpha male. He's not bombastic. You rarely see a modern black male character who is soulful and intelligent. Similar to Chadwick Boseman, R.I.P.'s T'Challa and Black Panther, this is a powerful African-American leading man who is not angry, quick to violence, but stoic, using violence only when it is necessary. And it helps fight back against the harmful stereotype that black people are inherently more angry and quick to violence than white people. That's why the character was really angry in the original comics and isn't here, which is something that some people have taken issue with. You know, so, some user reviews basically say, this is not like the character I read about in the comics. And I understand you know, being, uh, yes, some some frustration f from that. But I do think it is extremely important to look at the political, like, when the character was created, that basically was the the image, you know. If, if a black person was going to seem... Um, let's see. If, if if it was white people making, you know, writing and directing the black character, then they would make them angry and, and violent. So some, you know, yeah, black exploitation, which I admit I have very little exposure to personally, but that kind of embraced and said, okay, sure, fine, we are loud and bombastic and that kind of thing, to basically try to take control of the narrative back, you know, but today it is extremely important to spread the message that black people are not inherently angry and violent. You know, basically, this stereotype was invented to prevent black people from getting equal rights. After all, if they're just unnecessarily angry all the time, how can you help them? When, in reality, the things that were said of black people, that they're violent, that they're rapists, were true of white slave owners. And Coulter put on 30 pounds, or 14 kilograms, for those of us who count things in the real way, of muscle for the role. And let's see, David Austin and Clifton Cutchery portray a young and teenage Lucas, respectively. And the, the you know, yeah, at, at least one critic pointed out his superpower literally is his skin, which is just a great, yeah. It's not his weakness. He's not, he's not lesser for being black. And Luke's hoodie is like Trayvon, Trayvon Martin's, so they are underlining that you can look like that and be a hero. Trayvon Martin did absolutely nothing wrong. And with Reva dead, Luke is, of course, hurt, because deep inside he's suffering of her lonely heart condition. And, yeah, that brings us to Mahershala Ali as Cornell Cottonmouth Stokes. And, yeah, he is the owner of Harlem's Paradise Nightclub, the cousin of Mariah Dillard, who deals in illegal operations. Ali describes Stokes as a Godfather-type villain. While head of Marvel Television, Jeff Loeb referred to, his, to him as the other hero of the story, considering the tradition of previous Marvel Netflix villains Wilson Fisk and Kilgrave. Showrunner Cheo Hodari Coker, a former music journalist, said that the attitude of rapper Biggie Smalls particularly influenced his version of Cottonmouth. And let's see. Right, and Elijah Booth portrays a young Stokes. Simone Missick portrays Mercedes Misty Knight. 
a Harlem NYPD detective with a strong sense of justice who's determined to learn about Cage. Mystic said she's her own person. She's not the wife. She's not a girlfriend. She's not a side piece or a sidekick. Mystic described Misty Knight as a person who has a very strong moral compass, who is absolutely dedicated to protecting her community. Adding her proudest moment in playing the character was the fact that she believes in the system, even though with our current times, it's difficult to believe in the system. And... Yeah, um, in the series, Knight has what Mystic called a superpower, referred to as Misty Vision, that allows her to look at a crime scene and deduce, deduce what happened. The visualization of it is her standing at the crime scene as the crime is carried out. Now, it's not reinventing the wheel, but it is nevertheless very effective. And... Let's see... Theo Rossi plays Hernan Shades Alvarez, a relentless, menacing, smooth and manipulative street smart criminal. And let's see. Yeah. He is very, very compelling. You, you know, Theo Rossi, this is not the first time that he has appeared in something where he has to to say you know he he has to act as if it's normal for the world around him to have these really ridiculous elements and yeah um since avatar 2 is right around the corner i have been rewatching the the Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles is the name of it, since the creator of that show is the co-writer of Avatar 2. And Theo shows up, I won't give away how much, but he appears in at least one episode, and he has to convincingly deliver the line, metal keeping secrets from skin, and you're okay with that. Now, if you don't... That was a thing. Like, for a while, they weren't allowed to use the word Terminator, so they would call them metal or refer to them by um, model number and that kind of thing. Metal keeping secrets from skin. So, Terminators keeping secrets from human beings, which, you know, yeah... That, and he sells it. He sells it in that show, and he sells it here. You know, he has to deal with Luke Cage, who has bulletproof skin, and that's, you know, yeah. Now, let's see. I think I will... Yes. Eric LaRay portrays... Uh, uh, Eric LaRay, LaRay Harvey portrays Willis Stryker. And I am not going to give a lot of details about him because it really is the... the yeah, I, I can barely say anything without spoiling. But he does a really... Like, Everybody gives a great acting performance on this show. And Jared Kemp portrays a teenage striker. And Rosario Dawson, yet again, plays Claire Temple. You know, so basically the... the yeah. If you've been watching the, the Marvel Netflix shows... Leading up to this, you've seen the character multiple times. And, yeah, she continues to do really great. And the the relationships with ha she has with characters in this can be quite compelling. And Alfred Woodard, as Mariah Stokes Dillard, 
a local councilwoman, Stokes' cousin, looking to bring change to Harlem. And let's see. Though Dillard is not necessarily a criminal herself, she does feel a responsibility to her family, including Cornell. Woodard, who lives in Harlem, was convinced to join the project after Coker proved his love of Harlem and its culture. Now, let's see. Yeah. Gabrielle Dennis plays Tilda Johnson, also an interesting character, but I can't go into more. And Mustafa Shakir plays John McIver, and he's also very, very interesting. And, yeah, since this does involve several characters that were introduced on other Marvel Netflix shows, obviously it's important to, to note, are they consistently characterized? And the ones... I would say largely that there are a couple of instances in this show where a character will change in a way that while I don't personally find it to be incongruous with what we've seen up to that point for that character or based on the things that they experience, some I've, I've seen a number of people say that they really felt that it was, like, some, some have used the term a complete 180. So that is definitely something that, you know, if you are looking to possibly watch the show, you might also feel that way. And... Let's see... Yeah, so in, in general, the, the diversity is quite good, like... I already mentioned, you know, a lot of a lot of African Americans, a lot of you know, a, a number of Latinx people, but it does also have, for example, some East Asian people, and I think that is all I'm going to. Yeah. So. The yeah, this is a show where the characters have opinions and discuss them with each other. And there are some characters who choose their words very carefully, debate and define the meanings of words, especially negatively loaded ones. You know, whether or not it is acceptable to use the N-word, you know, f for black people to use the N-word. There's no, you know, the, the show doesn't entertain the ridiculous notion that it's uh, acceptable for white people to use the N-word. But there are a number of different characters who have different opinions on whether or not it is okay for black people to use the n-word if they if they should reclaim it if they should own it if if the just you know of a, um, a lot of different opinions and the show has them actually express these opinions so it you know the show is the show is able to explore this idea because the you know it's it's not for me. The the I'm not qualified to engage to to take part in that debate. But it does make a lot of sense that you know black people would try to, to, to you know yeah w would debate it would try to determine how they feel the word should be treated, given the yeah the the negative history and the more recent attempts to redefine it as uh, you know a not as as not a slur but just a you know uh, yeah like a, a something that some could use as uh, um, what's the word uh, to brag and history and historic people that have made a huge difference for black people are mentioned, invoked, referenced, and yeah, the, sh the show gets a huge, it, it really knows, you know, the, the, yeah, the show is written and directed by people who know black history and who understand 
th yeah, it really is, like, just, um, it's, it's crucial in, in determining how to proceed. And there are, in fact, there are, there are a couple of episodes where a character will talk about what another character has done, you know, to, to, yeah, to that character's face, and, and, and basically, yeah, every time they've de described something, they mention a historically significant, you know, person that it reminds them of as a way to, yeah. I really can't give more away than that, but just, yeah. I won't spoil who, but the characters that stay around for the longest in the show tend to get the most development, become tremendously interesting, go through a lot of growth. Now, you know, I realize this might sound obvious, but honestly, there are shows that ran much longer than this did that did not accomplish that. Like, really, if I if I sat down and watched one of their earliest episodes, like, today, I, you know, I'd be like, wow, they, they started out like that? Oh, wow, I kind of remember they started out like that, and they ended up this completely different. So, yeah. And... Yeah, so the, the dialogue is very well written. There's a lot of lines where characters in this just talk the way people do in real life. Like, there are, there are discussions about who's the best martial arts movie star. You know, with the, the, they, they might debate, you know, what's the best rap made by this particular group or artist and, and such and just yeah it it is it is incredibly natural like if it if it wasn't so incredibly well shot and edited i would think they just took a camera and filmed real people just being themselves and, yeah, there are some necessary exposition and kind of, you know, some, sometimes characters will slow down and just explain something because it's necessary to get it explained. But they do tend to, to handle that fairly smoothly. I, I didn't really feel like they're just you know, yeah, getting, getting it, ah, what's the word, having, having someone just spit it out, and so they can move on, so the cinematography was handled by Manuel Bilater and Petra Linomas, and, yeah, I already talked a little bit about the, the cinematography, but it really is just, like, the camera doesn't... Th th this was filmed by people who realized that you can do more with a camera than just point it at the, the, the subject. You know, you the way you move the camera... The, the color grading and these things make a huge difference. And it really is, like, there's a, there are a number of shots that are bathed in this golden brown, like, light of, basically sunlight. And, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and then, you know, you have shots that, you have stuff that takes place, you know, at night, and, you know, maybe it's lit by street lamps, and, and it has this more gloomy look to it. And, yeah, the, the, when, when the camera is moved, it's always motivated. It's never just to show off. It's never just to, you know, 
whatever, we don't feel like standing still with the camera right now. And that brings us to the editing, which was handled by Miklos Wright, Jonathan Chipnell, Tirsa Hacksaw, Marie Lee, Tim Merkovich, and John Otazwa. Now, I really love the editing on this show. Uh, you know, there are times where it toys with time and place, employing Nolan's smooth editing between past and present, also seen in the excellent movie Martha Marcy May Marlene. At times, in inner cut showing both a crime, it being cleaned up, the cops investigating afterwards, very effective. It tells us the kinds of crimes that happen, how good the organized criminals are cleaning up cleaning them up to hide the truth of what happened, and the struggle for the cops to investigate how hard they work to find out what happened. Let's see. And it also, it makes good use of cutting, like, intercutting between dramatic, you know, situations that are maybe distinct, but thematically important to intercut. And, yeah, cutting between, like, the present and, like, up, you know, many years in the past. The special effects are quite good. Now, obviously, the Netflix budget does limit what they can do. But instead of being stubborn and, you know, just saying, no, well, I, no, we're going to have this much. No, they actually... Make sure to ration the budget. Every so often you'll get a really big, clearly expensive, you know, sequence, often action. But it doesn't feel the need to constantly, like... Yeah, it's... It, when, when they don't have the money for something really big, they find a way to, to just... Yeah, and, and the money doesn't only go to these big sequences, it also goes to the, the, you know, this immensely talented crew and the equipment they use and such. Now, there's also some really, really great stunt work, and for sure you can tell the difference between the two seasons. In, in the first season, it isn't quite as hard hitting as it gets in the second and that really isn't to say that it's bad in the first but it definitely yeah in when you get to the second it's really really strong and yeah so this uh, you know according to IMDb this was the, the yeah New York City was where it was filmed. There wasn't any other, and honestly, I believe that. It, it really feels like they just... Everywhere in Harlem that was... that that would fit what they were doing, they, they filmed there. So, the action includes chases, physical fights, you know, shootings, like, yeah, you can't shoot Luke Cage, but there's still a lot of people that can't be shot, so yeah, guns are still a very popular weapon for the... And yeah, you know, I already mentioned it, there, there's this hard-hitting quality to it. When someone gets hurt, it actually hurts, you know, it, they, there's, a, there's a consequence to it. Some, you know, someone will have, like... Uh, you know, some maybe some bones broken or take a, a bullet and maybe it's not fatal, but it means that they, you know, it, it slows them down, you know. And, they, you know, obviously that isn't, you know, that by, by this point that was completely standard for the Marvel Netflix shows. But, yeah, it's, it's still very much here, even if this is a character who, you know, can take a lot of punishment and you know, not have a single mark on him. So the music is really, really excellent. So the, uh, let's see, the series music, according to MDB, was by Ali Shaheed Muhammad and Adrian Young. 
Here on YouTube, you can find the scores for the various Netflix shows. For some of them, there's 30 to 60 minutes, 40 tracks. For the two seasons of Luke Cage, there are 213 individual songs, and I don't know how many hours, but yeah. And they are all amazing. Like, there's no... You never get the sense that it was like, okay, uh, some poor unpaid intern is being pushed. He, he's, he has to fill out the entire soundtrack. Okay, uh, let's just grab this one randomly and put it in. Every single one of them is the is the right choice for it. You know, this uh, the it's it's very clear that this was assembled by people who know and love this music already. This was not really. It, it, yeah, just in general, this was made by people who already know and love, for example, Harlem and black culture in general. And they're they're not, you know, it's it's not a bunch of phonies trying to pass something off as as real. They are delivering the real experience to, to you know, everyone. And yeah, according to Wikipedia, it features many musical guests as well as a 90s hip hop score by Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad. If you're white, you may not realize non whites have actual culture. You might be shocked by how amazing the score is in here. You know, other than hip hop, it has funk, RB, blues, rock music. I think every single jazz, I'm not sure there's any kind of black music that never appears on this show. I, I really don't think that... Uh, reggae was one I, I f f forgot to mention. It's not that there isn't reggae on the show. Now, one user review... I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Said, basically, sure, the music is good, but there's no point to the times where an episode will show someone performing for several minutes in a row. I have to completely disagree. Every single time that happens, it's to express what one or more characters are feeling and thinking. And you, you know, so, yeah, sometimes they will cut from the person performing to a close up of the face of the person that is feeling or thinking it. And, and the acting carries, even though they're not, they're not saying anything, they might not even be moving. Like often it is just, they're, they're standing there, they're listening to the music in the club. And we see that this, yeah, this is how they feel about, it. you know, it would have been extremely easy to just have a bunch of musical guests and not having mean something. I've seen a number of shows where Basically, the musical guest is there to draw in an audience, you know. And, yeah, in in this show, it always works with the the music. The, yeah. And, yeah, you know, I already mentioned that Cornell owns, you know, the club called Harlem's Paradise. That's where the musical guests come in, and... For sure, there are a lot of them. Some of the characters on this show spend most of their lives sitting inside Harlem's Paradise. And that brings us to the sound design, which is really, really strong. Nobody knows, because it isn't real, what bulletproof skin would sound like when a bullet hits it nobody knows what it would sound like if you picked up metal and just like you know yeah squeezed it with with your fist nobody knows what that would sound like because that's not something we can just do you know yeah we do have we have machines that can manipulate metal but if you just picked it up in your fist and just closed your fist on it, you know. So they had to figure that out. And they did a really, really good job. Like, we don't necessarily think... We're so, we're so spoiled for choice today that we don't necessarily think about... Like, if you have a special effect where the audio doesn't match, you're just... We're just not gonna buy that it's real. And that's, that is something you see in... Movies that were made by people who had too small, you know, too too uh, low of a budget, 
can for for what they chose to to try to do for people who maybe didn't completely know what they were doing when they tried making a movie um yeah some movies that are very old today and are from back when sound design wasn't really thought of as as necessary but if you tr you know i i defy you try to watch you know when when you watch some of this show and i hope you will try to try to mute when you see someone you know yeah when you see bullets bounce off luke's skin when you see him crush metal like it was tinfoil you know and see if you still believe that what you're seeing, you know, that, that that's what you're seeing. Or if you start to see, oh, that's just, it's just an effect. You know, because the, the sound effect really sells it. And, yeah, they, they do such a good job on, on this. And that... Let's see. So, so yeah, the, the pacing... There's definitely an issue with there being 13 episodes. But, but, you know, there's two seasons. Both of them have 13 episodes each. 26 episodes total. And they don't have quite enough story and, and character growth and such to stretch all of them. Now, some people have felt that this was a really huge problem. I don't... I don't agree that it's a, a huge thing, but it does definitely, you know, every so often there'll be something in the show where you can tell they kind of just had to, yeah, they had to stretch something for longer than, yeah. And that brings us to, yeah, so... I would definitely say the best element of this show is its informed depiction of the African-American experience. And the worst aspect is probably the, the MCU villain problem. And yeah, uh, I think, yeah, the following is arguably a spoiler. So skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Mutants skip ahead and she's zoom alone around Dick's finger if you do not want any spoilers, even though I try to keep it vague enough that, yeah. Anyway, one of the worst pro aspects of this show is that it fares very poorly, perhaps the worst of any Marvel Netflix show that had come out by the time this show ended in an area that every Marvel Netflix show has to deal with. Why doesn't the titular character manage to defeat the central villain of the season is in less than 13 episodes, or in the case of the Defenders, less than 8? Most of these solve this in a natural, logical way. Daredevil Season 1, Matt has to start at the bottom, even figuring out who exactly is behind all the crime in Hell's Kitchen. At the start of the season, even the people who work directly beneath him don't dare say his name in front of each other. Season 2, Daredevil's finding the hand. It's really no wonder he's not able to take down such a massive, international, ancient organization in 13 episodes. And, you know, the same thing for Iron Fist Season 1. In Jessica Jones Season 1, Kilgrave is extremely difficult to catch. The decades have taught him to be careful. In Season 2, she has to solve the mystery first. In the first season of The Punisher, the villains have gone to great lengths to protect themselves. And, yeah, the, the Defenders probably fare the the very best of these uh, up to this point maybe for example iron fist season two does better but the villains actually easily overpower the heroes and are very frequently close to beating them the heroes have to retreat and then the villains find them again so you know but in both seasons of luke cage luke knows who he needs to take out he knows where they are they struggle to injure him you know I, at first, he's a reluctant hero, and that makes sense. But after that, you have episodes where we, the viewer, wonder 
why doesn't he just go and take out the villain? No more spoilers. Let's see. So, um, yeah, I, I already mentioned the, the pacing and the MCU villain problem. Other than those, the, you know, a way too frequent point of criticism from user reviews was, where are the good white people? And, yeah, the thing I was most worried about was that it would do a bad job of conveying progressive values, but it absolutely exceeded my expectations there. And, yeah. And, yeah. Um, one of the things I was most looking forward to was definitely Mahershala Ali, who I have been a fan of since the 4400. And, yeah, he does an incredible job here. He's, like, his character just really gets to you. And, yeah. So, let's see. It, yeah, so I already mentioned that the both season openers and season finales are great. The overall seasons are also both great. And... Yeah, I love every episode, although there are definitely some where I did feel like, you know, the way it started and the way it ended, it seemed like more could have happened over the course of it, or maybe it wasn't necessary to have 13 episodes. Now, the trailers do give at least a little bit too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the season is like. And the cover and poster do not give too much away. Now, yes, yeah, so the. Right, yeah, on. Right here on YouTube, I found 17 reviews, several music videos and trailers and such. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it is certified fresh. Season 1 has a 90% on the tomato meter based on 72 critic ratings 65 of which are fresh a 66 percent audience score which is based on 320 user ratings now let's see right so the average critic score was 8.00 out of 10 the average user rating was 3.5 out of Five. And for some reason, it does not have... If you if you go to season two, for some reason, it... it um, yeah, it, it doesn't have anything for the critics. It does... Let's see, for, for the users, it is... Oh, huh. I guess that was put, yesterday there wasn't anything but anyway now season 2 has an 85% rating and it's based on 62 critic ratings 53 of them are fresh so that's also certified fresh and that brings us to metacritic where it has a 74 out of 100 based on 43 critic reviews. I am just very briefly going to... Yes, so 36 positive ones, only 7 mixed and 0 negative ones. And... The user score is 6.5 out of 10, based on 95 ratings, 55 positive, 20 mixed, and 20 negative. And... Huh, only 7 reviews, and only 5 of them are... 
in English. Now, the right, so on IMDb, there are, let's see. There, yeah, so there are 406 user reviews, 297 without spoilers, and let's see, so in the, yeah, in the IMDb external reviews section, there are 91 links and 48 that were in English and not dead links, and it has a 7.3 out of 10 based on 130,056 user votes so the yeah 26 percent gave it seven 25.3 gave it eight 13.0 gave it six 12.3 gave it 10 11.6 gave it nine 5.4 gave it five 2.3 gave it four 2.0 gave it one 1.3 gave it 3, and 0.8% gave it 2. Yeah. Some of those scores are very, very low, and that is baffling to me that... Yeah. Now, the, this show won six awards and were nominated for 22. So, yeah, it won a primetime Emmy. What's that say? Outstanding Stunt Coordination for a Drama Series for James Liu. And, yeah, it was nominated for the Screen Actors Guild Awards for a number of the... Let's see, actors, and it won a Saturn Award, tied with Stranger Things, for Best New Media Television Series. It was nominated, Mike Coulter was nominated for Saturn, Best Actor on Television. It won the African American Film Critics Association. Uh, let's see, oh, fifth place for top 10 TV shows. And it Mahershala Ali won a BET award for best actor. Let's see. And it yeah, several actors were nominated for Black Reel Awards for Television 2019. And let's see. The Chio Hodari Coker won a Black Reel Outstanding Writing Drama Series award. And let's see, then we have nominees for Black Reel Awards for Television. And there we go. So the. Yeah, so the, the show employs some violence and it never really has like gratuitous violence. Like if a character is hurt and it's not like it would be, it would be ugly and in bad taste to show, it doesn't show it. it just, we're, we're told that it happened. And, yeah, when when it happens, when we see violence, it does hit. You know, this is one of those stories about organized crime that is trying to be, you know, try, trying to put the, the violence inherent in organized crime right there for us to see so that we can really appreciate how you know, dangerous and violent a world it is. And it does also have sex scenes and nudity and such. And it tends to tell us where characters are. Like, if you see two people having sex, 
that tells you that they're, you know, they are in a place, you know, not, well, uh, also physically, but emotionally where they are having sex, you know. It's, it's not for, like, titillation or just there to, to draw in an audience. And, you know, there is some male gaze, but there's definitely also some female gaze. And... Yeah, so... You know, if you don't already have Disney+, Plus, if you care about the MCU, you know, by now, like, there's almost nothing MCU that isn't... Like, I think... Let's see, do they have all the Spider-Man movies by now? Um... Huh. Uh, they don't have any of the MCU Spider-Man movies, at least. Oh, wait, no, there we go. They do have Homecoming. They still don't have the other two, but yeah, the... You know, and they do, yeah, they have Into the Spider-Verse. They have the Raimi trilogy and both of the amazing Spider-Man movies. So, but, but yeah, you know, basically everything else MCU, they, they do have. Even the, the stuff that was temporarily supposed to be MCU but ultimately, you know, is no longer considered canon. Like, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and these Marvel Netflix shows. So, yeah. If you don't already have Disney+, Plus and you care about the MCU, it is a really great place to just, you know, you'll, you'll have all, almost all of it there. And, yeah. It, uh, uh, let's see. I don't think it has any... Special features, but let's double check. Absolutely no special features, no. And let's see. Yeah, that brings us to the rating. So, yes. I rate this eight well-informed black people changing the world for the better. And I am just going to find it in here because I just realized I accidentally didn't copy it in, but here we go. So. Ranking all of the Marvel Netflix shows leading up to and including this one. Worst to best. I love all except for Iron Fist Season 1. So, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Luke Cage Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 1. And, yeah, so, hit me up in the comments, let me know who are you hoping will make the jump from Marvel Netflix into MCU, and, yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell, like, it didn't think of a punchline before it started its sentence. There should be a link to my main channel page and one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spell thoughts on a movie. And let's see. Oh, and these days also one talking about the my thoughts, my spell of thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. 
and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in separate videos, since its running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want more videos like this, be in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.